to intro, welcome to the channel and welcome to my new subscribers whether you're coming over from TikTok or Rumble or the podcast, welcome. I've got my decaf coffee, I've got my wrap because guys I'm filming outside, um, my housemates are home and there's no way I can edit out the amount of noise from the housework that's happening. I definitely needed a break from the housework. Um, so here we are. So guys, I was watching Simon Whistler last night, he's got a multitude of channels, so Decoding the Unknown, Casual Criminalist, uh, the one that I watch when I'm not feeling great with the world and need a break is Brain Blaze, formerly Business Blaze. Um, guys, can I just say Simon puts on the persona as well, so a lot of the jokes in Brain Blaze are actually running jokes, you've got to go right back and watch them to understand the running gags about a meme accountant, about people allegedly being trapped in the basement as well. Um, when I was watching, it was around fraudulent medical research and fraudulent um, studies, um, papers being recalled, sometimes it's just a typo, sometimes it's just a medicine, sometimes there's like really simple mundane issues, but they went into things like the MMR vaccine, they didn't surprisingly do the pan recall, so I'm going to submit the script to his model and see where that goes, nothing mentioned, nothing gained as well. Um, but I mentioned in the comments section that because someone was promoting a anesthesiology medication, so for putting you under when you're going to have a medical procedure, uh, I was mentioning, oh, all like me, if the I ended up with brain injury from surgery. And people were going, hang on, wait, what? Um, because Simon was... He's a YouTuber, very uneducated. He thought that an anesthesiology was performed by a nurse. He did not realise it's a very highly trained and specialised field and that the anesthesiologists aren't just the ones that gas you up. They are the ones that are monitoring everything nowadays, including your brain function. And that realised that when I started typing out my story in the comment section, I was like, hey guys, I've got my own channel. And people who were like trying to search it were like, but you haven't told the story of how you got the brain injury. So I guess it's time to be self-indulgent and tell people. So I have done a bit of a life update video when I've touched on my injuries, but I haven't touched on how I have acquired them. So the first injury or disability is my brain damage. So I was a preemie baby but developed normally. Um, my parents were at the time, mum was put to the bookbinder table hand, dad was working for the railways overseeing containerization in Queensland Rail um, as well. I had two sisters, um, both older, so I'm the happy surprise of Family, let's put it that way. Um, all was normal until I had tonsil infection after tonsil infection after ear infection. Um, so it was decided at the tender age of three years old I needed to go in and have a tonsillectomy. I had a allergic reaction to a medication that I believe is no longer used in children and I don't even think it's on the market anymore because of my reaction. I had an analogic reaction and that reaction was a cardiac arrest under a general anaesthetic. Um, because we didn't have the research, I actually spent, they believe it was two to three minutes without oxygen to the brain. So that is why now anesthesiology is so highly trained and you've got to be so on it with your breathing, heart rate, why they ask so many what people perceive are invasive questions around smoking, around vaping, around illegal drugs. Guys, they're not the police. Be honest with your healthcare professionals about what they're taking, your weight and who you're having sex with. 
that is really important because it gives them information of testing that you might need to go through, prophylaxis, if you need PrEP or any other medications to prevent STIs as well. I digress, guys. Um, so basically, we didn't have the NDIS in Australia at the time because, guys, I'm a 1984 vintage, so back in the 80s, it was basically block funding for profoundly disabled children or a group home. Um, that was the options given to me. But mum, or my parents, mum was not giving up. She did research and found a amazing, amazing lady that by the name of Kirsten Adams, who was an occupational therapist um, specialising in early childhood development. Um, guys, if you want to know what OT is like, definitely check out Starfish Therapy and All Kids Are Perfect. Um, all Kids Are Perfect do something that's a bit different to occupational therapy. They do dynamic movement therapy, which I reckon is going to be the next phase of occupational therapy. So, and guys, I have heard my mum when she's talking to my support team and when we're onboarding new support workers saying that time and time and time again, occupational therapy in the 80s in Queensland, Australia was considered akin to pseudoscience. And I love what AJ from Y Files says that the different oftentimes the difference between pseudoscience and science is time and money. I believe AJ's exact quote is the difference often between pseudoscience and science is time. So guys, we all know of it now. It's often embedded into special schools and schools aimed at children with psychosocial disabilities. So brain damage, severe epilepsy, ADHD, autism, anxiety, social disorders as well. Because um, a lot of those times there's a lack of coordination, there's things like dyspraxia as well. Um, so I did that all through primary school. Um, because it wasn't embedded into school, I was taken out of primary school math to be able to do the occupational therapy. Guys, technology has really helped me, like computers and calculators. But now I've got the time, I'm using resources like Crown Academy, the local uni library, um, support staff to teach myself maths to go and finish a natural health degree as well. Um, so guys, that is where I had developed a brain injury from as well. And then guys, in year 10, I had influenza A. I never really recovered from it because I was in the normal high school, normal requirements for high school, but year 10 I was doing all board level subjects except I was doing like the really basic maths and the really really basic English um, and remedial stuff and maths as well. Ironically I was really interested in science and I think I would have got better grades in science if I had those math skills but we can't go back and fix time as well. But then, um, so, year 11 goes by without event, but year 12, didn't really know what I wanted to do, it was really fluid, um, having some violent seizures was the first realisation that I had viral meningitis, thank God my sister was trained in first aid, woke up my parents and got an ambulance to me. I was rushed to, I believe, St Vincent's. Um, because of that, I developed epilepsy. But I was able to, with the support of family and friends, recover. Um, had two years basically recovering and getting my driver's licence. I got a job, which was in the local council. I was undiagnosed with the ADHD at the time, so I then did a pharmacy assistance training course and landed a job at the local shopping centre pharmacy 
Uh, guys, I won't go into that because I'm having a pharmacist come on the podcast who has known me since I was a precocious um, pharmacy assistant, very young. Um, he has asked me permission to tell a few stories from my mother's pharmacy, so stay tuned for that one. But then, guys, everything was kind of normal. Um, life punctuated as it is when you have epilepsy from a couple of seizures then guys I was on a medication that we didn't realize turned me slightly psychotic as well so that's where during COVID I developed MND due to the stress of masking as well but taking back a few steps when I unfortunately lost a job due to anxiety in the pharmacy I was seeing a job search provider um, guys in Australia they used to be government run and you had the same person from start to finish but they then decided to privatize it and a lot of people went into recruiting who didn't have a human resources background um, this person didn't understand retail at all I would eat in her office and she's like oh you need to take your breaks and I would try to explain to her, try to explain to her, try to explain to her. It just didn't work. And she was like, no, I'm going to withhold your social security payments if you don't go and see the counsellor. Went and saw the counsellor. The counsellor thought it was more than the ADHD. Um, because of that threat of withholding the payments, I was then forced to go and spend a lot of money seeing a psychiatrist and got diagnosed with the ADHD. Due to that psychiatrist's behaviour, um, I no longer see her. Um, because, guys, let's just say she's not a great fit for me. She's a fit for other people, but not a great fit for me as well. And then, so I'm now working with a counsellor and a neuropsychiatrist that are much better fit for me around the ADHD as well. But then um, I was on medication for neuropathy because we didn't know about the Sjogren's at the time that sent me psychotic and in 2018, 18, when I got my first NDIS package I decided I could live on my own. Um, I did have support staff help me to live independently but I liked the idea of living independently and on my own. I did not like the reality of it. Um, I think a lot of people go through that, but then um, during 2000, Christmas 2019, 2020, we had some really horrific storms in Queensland. Um, I had a dripping ceiling. Um, real estate and I got into the argument, the easiest solution was for me to move. I moved away from family and friends, still in the same city, but then lockdown hit. Um, guys, because I didn't realise that this medication sent me slightly paranoid, slightly psychotic, I was still attached to reality, but was making decisions that were out of character, pushing people away, um, not able to separate fact from fiction as well. Um, guys, can I say some of my friends still don't talk to me because of that, they're still building up that trust again as well but each to their own. So then um, I got diagnosed with FND after having a big tick and couldn't communicate what was wrong. I did it like a maximia culpa to the doctors and they were like, oh, no, it's not suitable for you to live on your own. So my parents and my care team packed up my unit. I was not really coping with life at the time. Had a really bad internet addiction. Um, had support workers trying to undermine family because they saw me as the cash cow and saw this as going back. Guys, check out Good and Bad Support if you want to know that story. Then we like, had, I believe it was six to 12 months back at the parental's house and that was awkward because my routine and their routine are very very different as well but they got used to care teams and we got the right organisation for me 
So it was a right fit for a while until they changed CEOs and we were just cycling through support workers as well. Um, we found first Phil House, that's literally next door, and then, guys, I've got to own this. I grew up as a support worker. Um, again, check out good and bad support for that reason. And then, uh, guys, I, when the CEO of this housing organisation understood that there was more to the story, that when I blow up at someone, it's for what I perceive as a bloody good reason. And there was a few other incidents around this support worker and her level of commitment to this job because she is directly related to the CEO of the business. Um, she's no longer working in these houses. Um, guys, it's got to be hard working with family, um, but you need to have that commitment to the job and be able to separate family from business. Um, you're here as a support worker to do a job um, as well, but definitely check out what is good and bad support um, to see how that played out. And now I'm quite happy in this one. In fact, I was saying to the support worker who was doing a sleepover last night, I've got it so good that I've got to catch myself to not become over entitled as well. But during the time that I was in the first seal house, we were able to get a diagnosis of Sjogren's, which is arthritis, but also autoimmune as well. So I'm now managing that um, as well. And literally yesterday I went and got my CPAP changed. It wasn't the pressure, it was actually a nozzle for my CPAP. And that was the last piece of the puzzle getting me as well as possible is my sleep. So now we're going through the sleep training and the sleep hygiene and me cleaning my CPAP more regularly and looking at medications that we could be causing me odd sleep behaviours because related to my sleep is parasomnias. So guys, you might have heard of sleepwalking and when people are on things like Ambien or gummies, um, or even melatonin. I think the most famous one in this Australia is one of our Olympians sleep driving and gambling. Um, I get up to the fridge and don't remember eating. So we're now looking at retraining that behaviour. So guys, that's how I ended up in the position of life I am as well. And guys, let me say it has not been an easy ride, especially from 2018 when I was on that medication to now. So I've got to thank care teams. Like, I know I'm a hard ass on support workers, but there are some bloody brilliant ones out there as well. Um, guys, in regards to care team support workers, it can take a couple of organisations, or if you choose to go independent, um, a couple to find the right fit you as well. Um, I've got again what is good support, support, what to look for in a support worker and a podcast on support workers, how to read the room, really good insights in support. I would like to think so. And um, guys, as I said, welcome to my new subscribers. And guys, if you can like, share, subscribe, comment, really helps the channel grow. And to my Rumble viewers, thank you very much for commenting as well. And guys, just a bit of housekeeping is that we keep it polite. Definitely allowed to have different opinions, but keep it polite. Um, differing views are welcome, but for one thing that I stake my YouTube on is that your disability is not an excuse. What I mean by that is that be accountable where you can for what you can be. It's not an excuse, it's not a cop out, but it is a valid reason. Sometimes the way you act, sometimes the way that you behave or not being able to do things for yourself, but finding where that is can be, as I said, a journey that will take years. So guys, again, if you can like, share, subscribe, comment, and I'll see you guys in the next video.
video and shout out to Simon Whistler. Your content is amazing and has got me through some really hard times in life. See you guys.